to can everyone see from 12 miles away? For those of you that are joining in, we are over in the 3D Buzz IRC, which is at irc.3dbuzz.com, by the way. Matter of fact, I can go ahead and show our screen out to everyone. And with that, if you, oh, Segfault, it's okay, you typed over there. Hey, David, it's good to see you were able to make it today, sir. And let's see, a quick browser. For those of you that are seeing the screen and um, you've never been over into the IRC, if you go to 3dbuzz.com, if you don't have a client installed, here's a, a simple, easy way to go about doing this. Just go to 3dbuzz.com and from the top menu, click on chat. And then you can just go ahead and choose your nickname and then connect. And then once you get connected, uh, join into it's just slash forward slash join space pound class and um, just so that we don't end up flooding the 3d buzz channel right hey the instructions help because people are coming yeah, in. somebody managed to get in we still have people coming in right now the attendees list is continuing to grow there's nearly 700 people registered today and that's that's going to make things interesting interesting yes. so largest webinar type class that we have uh, hosted yet. So again, for those of you that are just now coming in, we're giving it just another minute. Everybody's coming in. Um, please feel free to join us over in the IRC. And again, because I, I still see people coming in, just go to 3dbuzz.com. If you don't have an IRC client, just click chat at the top. And then once you've clicked chat um, and connected, just join or slash join pound Three or pound class, yeah. Hey, Brisland, good to see you made it, sir. I'm already getting some people over in the questions panel asking if they can type here. Uh, I'd appreciate it if you just left uh, straight up questions over there in the questions panel for the webinar system, and then use IRC just for standard uh, chatting. And as far as the the question about the go to webinar stuff. Um, with the yeah, we don't have regular chat ability with GoToWebinar, unfortunately, and so it just used the name that you registered with, and that's all. For those of you that are apologizing for having typed anything over in the questions panel, don't stress it. Today's not about stressing. Today is about having a little bit of fun. And binary, I'll tell you right now, having three monitors is a godsend. I love it. And as you can see over in the IRC, we still have people flooding into the class. So, and the numbers in the webinar system keep in yes, they do as well. So we're just bear with us, guys. We're going to be kicking things off here in just a few minutes. And Mohammed had a question over in the questions panel. Any details or news about the C++ class? We're going to have a section over announcements here very um, soon. Yeah. Actually, there are several questions in there we probably could address. Yeah, and, and we will, guys. We'll just let everybody get in here real quick. Any way to use the questions panel on the iPad? That's a, uh, that's a really good question. I have not used the iPad client for the webinar system. No. I would think that they would give you some means of doing that. The IRC channel, that's uh, at irc.3dbuzz.com, and... The actual room that we're in is the channel hash is, sign yeah, class. Is, is hash class. And somebody asked about the version of UDK we're using. I'm actually using the February build instead of the March build. The March build only came out it was like either yesterday or the day before, and I'd already done all of my R&D on the February build. So just to be safe... I'm using that one. I don't see any reason why you shouldn't be able to follow along with the March build, uh, but I just did this to be safe. Don't you I, know how it goes. If any of you have ever been uh, all like demonstrating artists for anything, you totally understand where I'm coming from here. Um, it's slash, uh, Stephen, it's slash join pound class. Um, put a there's space. A space yeah, there's a space. And hash. Oh, 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 Stephen. Make sure you go. Just go to the regular 3D Buzz website. 
um, first. Yeah, I'm sorry. I thought you were in an IRC client. Yeah, and then click chat up here. And then you click connect down here. Here's Zach. Let's type your name in. Zach. Oh, yeah, sure. We shall show. Thanks. Connecting to server now. And, and then yourself. forward slash join, join space pound class. class. And now press enter. Ta-da! And here in just a minute, it'll probably change my name to guest or something because I'm not about to log in. Ah, gotcha, Stephen. Hopefully that'll get you connected right into it. Sweet. No, you don't need 3ds Max or anything for this class. Really, all you need is UDK running. Uh, somebody also asked uh, the level of today. Please remember the name of the class is Introduction to UDK. Uh, so this will be an intro level class. That's right. So the 85% of you that are already UK users, bye bye. <laughs> What was the code again? The code to join into the IRC? Here, just yeah, just this. leave it up there. Yeah. Um, there you go. So if you just type that, you should be good to go. And numbers are still going up, so we're just trying to give a moment for everybody to get in, so we'll start off at, with hopefully most of the people currently in the class because uh, we will be making some announcements and the things that people are going to be asking about a little bit later on. Oh, and don't think I, I didn't hear that about the pound symbol. I did too. What about it? Oh, that that's pound is for the pound symbol used over in the UK. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for people in the uh, United States, so many that have no clue what that symbol so is for overseas. Pounds. I say pound on the uh, keyboard, and they immediately know what I'm talking about. <laughs> pound, hash, number sign, shift three Bush. on our keyboard. I mean, we've used a little bit of everything. Yeah. Yes, for those of you that are worried that you're only going to be here for part of it, uh, we will be recording this. Yeah. Which, as a matter of fact, let's go ahead and get um, recording software up now. Yeah, I was going to ask about that at some point. Probably about halfway through the class. It's going to explode with everything that we've got running today. Probably, probably. And we still have people flooding in, but we're going to be kicking off. Sorry. It's okay. Uh, we were fighting over the mouse for just I'll a minute. make sure everything works. All right. We'll wait two more minutes. Okay. And then we're going to be going. And those that come in late just come in late. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said uh, they only just started downloading UDK. If you're getting it right now, you... We'll probably be a little bit behind, but that's okay. Um, I'll go ahead and just give you guys kind of a quick heads up. We won't be able to do each and every little click of the mouse in this uh, in this <laughs> session to build an entire level. But uh, but you'll see you you should still get everything you need out of it. For those of you who are actually following along with your own install of UDK, uh, I recommend as we go you kind of downscale what it is you're trying to build. <laughs> and Wolfery. Five minutes to download 1.7 gigabyte? Nice. Are you still on dial-up? That's horrible. <laughs> Zach asked it, asked, it took me about a minute and a half. And you're proud of that? Oh, oh. oh thank heavens in the C-sharp class we don't have to rely on speed. I'm just messing with you, man. I miss the sound of dial-up as well. Oh, do you? <laughs> you type in your login and click the button for AOL and wait like five minutes while it barfed all kinds of noise at you. Uh-oh, 309. Uh-oh. People are still coming in, but sorry. We're yeah, going to have to get started we're here. We're about to, to hit our cap for waiting. The end of my patience. CLA Jones, that's a little more sexy. Four minutes, 32 seconds. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. The bigger number wins. And once again, for those of you who are wondering where all the chattings come from, we are over in the chat room over on 3D Buzz. And if you're having a hard time connecting, so uh, I know Lexus says, uh, hey guys, I can't join chat. And I click connect and it says terminated. Uh, huh, I honestly don't know about that. I wonder if there's, I wonder if, um, oh, what's the, uh, the thing we use to let people do it with the web? I forgot. Now oh, what it. Yeah, Mivit. I wonder if it has some sort of limit. I don't know. I don't know. I doubt it. Um, 
Let's see. Uh, not seeing anything super. Somebody did ask if they should have UDK running. You can if you want to. Um, if you want to kind of click on things while I click on things, you can. If you just kind of want to follow along and take some notes and then maybe just follow along with the recorded video later, that's cool too. If you're trying to keep up with every single thing I'm doing today, um, I will have to jump ahead a couple of times because we've only got a couple of hours. Yeah, and you think we're going to actually be on a couple of hours? You no. Funny. Well, we got a few hours. <laughs> yes. Well, we've got another class. We, we have a class, a C sharp class tonight at nine o'clock. And yeah. So we've, we've got, got kind of some until very then. devoted students in that class. So yeah. there's, there's no canceling. All right, that's it. We're doing it. Ready? Yep. Here we go. Three, two. Hello and welcome to the introduction to UDK webinar class. So today your lead presenter is Mr. Zach Parrish. Hey, how's it going? It's going pretty good. Today's class has close to 700 people registering and we still see more people coming into the webinar system uh, by the minute. Uh, because this class is so large, uh, we ask that you use the webinar questions panel only for questions and we're going to do the best we can to answer questions but again it's a very large large class so we cannot quite treat these the way we have some of our past webinars and we definitely cannot uh, treat this class with the same love and care that we give to our member sponsor classes because it would be in trouble we'd yeah, it, this well, would become a 24-hour class. Yeah, we'd be here until tomorrow sometime. Because this is an introduction to UDK class, please make sure that all of your questions are aimed at what Zach is doing. Um, for those of you that thought you could squeeze in here and start firing off some of the more advanced uh, Unreal scripting classes, there will actually be a place for that coming up soon, and we'll be talking about uh, upcoming classes here shortly. Um, but this is not the classroom for it. Uh, the final thing that I want to mention before I hand it over to Zach is that uh, if you'd like, you can join into the 3D Buzz IRC. Uh, just, and if you don't have an IRC client, simply head over to 3dbuzz.com, and from the menu at the top, you'll see Chat. Click on Chat, and then click Connect after you've put in uh, a username that you want to use. Once you've connected in, just type forward slash join space hash class. And I believe Zach still has, yes, yeah, so this is what you're going to type down there. Hit enter, and you will then join us over in the IRC. So, and some more people are coming in. Outstanding. And you guys are welcome to use the IRC to chat like crazy. Um, so anyways, with that, let me go ahead and hand it on over to Zach. Well, before we actually get rolling with the UDK stuff, did we have any announcements we wanted to make in regards I guess, to yeah, I guess we could 3D talk about Buzz that stuff? Uh, I do want to just kind of, it's not quite an apology, but I'm just going to tell you guys like it is. Uh, this is a free class, so we are going to kind of talk to you a little bit about some of the stuff that we've got going on over 3D Buzz, just kind of our little way to help pay the bills, so to speak. Uh, I do appreciate you just bear with us while we talk about some of this stuff. Well, not so much as pay the bills. I've had people that have gotten agitated in the past because they've missed out on something cool that we've done. They, that they could have known about. That, only because they couldn't find any information about it. Um, we were hoping to do this today, but it will take place tomorrow. There will be two classes that are going to be announced tomorrow. Uh, one is going to be an eight-week class over C++. It will be an introduction to C++. So basically it will be C++ 101. And registration will also finally open tomorrow. Um, as far as the dates, all of that information will be available tomorrow. We're still fleshing out times. But uh, that registration will be open tomorrow. There has been a tremendous amount of interest in that class. So make sure you are a member sponsor if you are interested in getting signed up for it. Uh, the next uh, class is going to be... Um, the Unreal class, UDK. And Zach, do you want to spend a little bit of time talking about the UDK class? Well, the UDK class is going to be a six-week class. Uh, and we're going to be announcing dates, times, and all of the availability of it a bit later. Uh, right now, what we're looking at is a special topics class uh, that will involve... Uh, I'm saying this tentatively. Uh, tentatively, will involve some scripting. Uh, will involve... 
uh, special focus topics. So it won't be the kind of thing like, here, we're going to build a level today. Uh, we're going to take a look at very specific things within UDK and go on from there. But I don't want to spill the beans on too much of that because we're still kind of polishing up exactly what topics are going to be there. But yes, I do want to include scripting for those of you who are really curious and antsy about that. Right. I did see a question over in the questions panel. There's a lot of questions, as a matter of fact. But Eric just asked, well, are, are we going to be having more advanced C++ classes? And the answer is yes. Currently, to test out the entire webinar and student interaction environment, we've got two classes that are going at the moment, the C Sharp 101 class and the Blender 101 class. And these classes are both in their fifth week. So next week is the last week of both classes. They have gone very well. I have, I have been highly impressed at just how smooth the classes have been. Uh, one of the things that we have uh, been doing is uh, doing open office hours. Now, I know we've not announced any for this week yet, and that's still kind of up in the air because this week has been all about preparing for this UDK class and finalizing all of the C++ stuff that is going to be uh, talked about and put up for registration tomorrow. So, um, so yeah, I just wanted to, to let you know, with these two classes, we've been able to successfully... Um, validate how well that we would be able to interact with students and, and it's been awesome and with the open office hours we give uh, one time that rotates throughout the week for students to come in and join us with specific questions that they may, may have or problems that they have um, and so anyways all of that is uh, that time is made available so it's, it's a heck of a deal for our member sponsors also all of the videos uh, that we do all of the classes are recorded in video form and then encoded and put up for our members to uh, to watch later. This video over the intro to UDK for anyone that has to leave early today will be encoded and made available a little bit later on this evening and you'll be able to just head on over to 3dbuzz.com, jump into the forums and you'll see it in the lounge. Um, so anyways, that'll be up a little bit later on. And I did see another question from Segfault asking about is there a C-Sharp 102 uh, class coming up? And yes, there will. We will continue that class with more advanced content as well. And we'll continue that class. Uh, it'll start up probably a week after the C-Sharp 101 class ends. But I'll have those details by next week as we're wrapping that class up. And these are certificated, uh, certificated classes as well as uh, long as you finish homework and you... Uh, attend at least 50% of the classes. And we're still uh, on the fence with testing at the very end, though I really like that. I do like the idea. I do. Absolutely. So uh, let's go ahead and jump over real quick. Now it's, it's time to spend just a second with you guys. There's a lot of questions over in the questions panel. Let's see if we can get through these real quick. Um, go ahead, Zach. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm just kind of trying to scan to the top. There's a lot to dig through, so I do ask that you bear with me. Uh, will there be Google Docs notes available for this lesson? Not during class. Um, I can give kind of a breakdown of what I used a little bit later if it helps, but I don't know if, how much of it's going to be of use to you. It's really shorthanded stuff. Uh, let's see, are there plans to hold Unreal Script classes? The upcoming UDK six-week class, um, as I said, the syllabus and the dates for that are all kind of being planned at the moment. So we're, also, we're kind of ironing out the specific details for that, but it is going to involve scripting. I feel really good about wanting to include some, uh, some Unreal Script in that. Uh, should I have UDK running? Only if you want to follow along uh, or just play around while I'm doing stuff. It's uh, really up to you. If yeah, if you have it up and going and you're new to, to UDK, I, I would highly recommend it. Yeah. Uh, then, let's see. Do -do -do -do. I'm just kind of scanning through. Thank you, guys. I love your videos. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Um, can I use UDK just like the mod SDK without coding anything? I'm more of a game artist. Absolutely. Um, now, when you are using it without any scripting whatsoever, UDK is more of a level design environment specifically for first-person shooters a la Unreal Tournament 3. It's very similar to that. But there's nothing wrong with that. You can still get a lot done that way uh, and really uh, get a lot of experience in working with the engine because there are a lot of artist-based tools in UDK, which I love. 
Uh, where can we see or download the recorded videos? As mentioned earlier, those will be available at 3dbuzz.com over in the forums. Just pay attention to the lounge forum specifically. That's where we're going to announce the availability of the downloadable video. This class will be downloadable. Future classes, in uh, like such as the six-week class that are available only to member sponsors, those will be streamed, again, only to our member sponsor subscribers, uh, which for those of you who are curious, that's a, a service that we offer at 3D Buzz that costs $35 a month, which really is kind of a steal for everything that you get especially with the live interaction in the classes. Also, I had a question come in. Um, will you be doing a, or still doing a Unity and Maya Live class or Advanced Simple Game in Unity? Yes, uh, all of those are still coming. The Unity game development class is going to be seen before we see the Maya Live class. And the Advanced Simple Game, we've been talking about uh, doing some, some fun things with these classes. Uh, one example is a weekend um, introduction to game development with Unity, like a boot camp class, where it's a hardcore Saturday and Sunday type weekend. Um, we've, we've had a lot of interest from various people that we've talked to about doing something like that. So, um, so yeah, that's, we're, all of those are still planned, but be looking for the Unity one to be available before the others. As far as plans for the CryEngine SDK, Onyx not at the moment. Uh, someone did ask if the UDK class is going to be looking at um, iOS development. That's something I would really like to reserve specifically for a mobile development class, but I'm not going to rule it out. Uh, it's something we may take a quick look at, but I think it would probably be more efficient and, and wiser all around to have a class that was specifically dedicated to mobile development inside of UDK. And Ivan asked, shall we start? We have started. Yeah. <laughs> That's, That's the beautiful the thing about us recording the videos, because not everybody likes the way that we go about presenting and answering questions and all that good stuff. Later on, you can always jump in and fast forward through the video, because this will be made available to download. Someone did ask if we're going to use uh, Blender with the UDK classes. I haven't decided what 3D package we're going to use along with, or if we're really going to need one for the topics I have in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, but we'll get to that. And will we be covering anything about mobile dev? Not today. Yeah, not today. Uh, today is actually going to be very straightforward from the introductory standpoint. Uh, so for those of you who are fairly advanced or have been playing with UDK for a little bit, uh, you will probably see a bunch of things you've already seen before. Uh, the only thing that, uh, I've, and I've already got several emails and messages about it, so I've had a lot of people ask if we're going to be looking at landscape instead of the old terrain system, and we are. We're going to give just a very brief uh, rundown of creating a piece of terrain with landscape. Yeah. Uh, but aside from that, a lot of this is stuff that we're gearing specifically toward the beginners who have not been playing with UDK and need a e either an introduction or perhaps a refresher. Okay. So that's for the most part, and there's still questions that are flooding in over there, but we do need to get started. All right, so uh, today, my goal is to get you at least passingly familiar with using UDK on your own. Now, if you have UDK open, and uh, if you'd like to follow along, please, by all means, do that. Uh, if you don't, you just kind of want to watch and go on from there, then you know, that's entirely up to you. First off, when you first launch UDK, you're going to get a, a screen that looks very much like this. And what I want to do is take just a moment and walk you through the key points of the UDK interface for those of you who have never seen it before. The big thing that is going to dominate your view and probably, uh, well, it may end up scaring you if you're, if you're totally new to this kind of thing, are your four viewports that are visible by default. These allow you to see into the 3D world that you are creating. And there are two flavors of viewport. You have your perspective viewport currently visible in the lower left-hand corner of my screen, and then your perspective viewports, which are available all around the sides. We have a side view in the upper left, we have a front view in the upper right, and we have a top view in the lower right. If you can't tell which ones are which, because uh, I mean, really, these all look like you know, your basic orthographic or no depth views. They look like flat blueprints, but it's hard to tell which one you're looking at at any given time. Take a look at the upper left-hand corner of each viewport. There's a great big letter which tells you what's going on. Uh, you have an S for side, you have an F for front, and you have a T for top. Now, somebody asked if this is the latest UDK build. Uh, almost. This is actually the February build. The March build just came out the other day, and so just for safety's sake, I'm using what I use for all of the R&D process for this class. Uh, because once or twice in my life, I have updated right before a presentation, which has caused all kinds of nightmares. But if you have the March build, I do not foresee you having any problems. So I'm just kind of covering myself uh, in this case. All right, so we have our viewports, but the next thing you're going to need to know 
Uh, somebody, somebody said, said Zach, you said perspective, perspective for orthogonal. orthogonal. Well, no, I apologize. Uh, we, we have three different orthogonal views, and they're going to be linked together. Now, the, the next thing you're going to need to know, though, is how to navigate these and how to get around. Let's start with the orthogonal views. Uh, these are pretty basic, and getting around them is extremely easy. If you just click and drag with your mouse button, you can move these around. That's with the left mouse button. If you use the right mouse button, you get the exact same behavior. If you use left and right mouse together, then you'll be able to zoom in and out. Now, somebody said, um, how do you enable four views? You can do uh, view, viewport configuration, and then you can turn on uh, your four view, which is right here in front of me. And because I'm staring at it, there you go, two by two split. If what you're seeing looks more like this when you first start off, I usually just grab this little button up in upper uh, right-hand corner of my view, and that brings the four view back. So uh, whichever one works for you. I am going to switch between these throughout the day. I'm going to try my best to remember to work in a smaller window whenever possible, but that's only because of video encoding and not making my video overly large, uh, because that can lead to all kinds of fun little problems. OK, so just a quick recap. All we've done is just navigate our orthogonal views with left or right mouse. If you use left and right together, you can zoom in and out. Very straightforward. Now, navigating your perspective view is a little bit of a different creature. If you click and drag with the left mouse button, it's kind of like driving a car in a way, or, or walking around. You can look left, you can look right. And if you move your mouse forward, you'll move forward. If you move your mouse back, you'll move back. So it's just kind of a neat little way to sort of fly around. If you click and drag with your right mouse button, you're just kind of turning your head. You're looking around. Then finally, if you use left and right together, you are panning vertically and horizontally, meaning you can slide left, you can slide right, and you can slide up and you can slide down. Now, between these various hotkey combinations, you can get pretty much wherever you want to get. However, by default, at least in more recent versions of the UDK, you're going to have the following preferences on. So if I go under Preferences, I can turn on Use uh, WASD for Camera Controls. So by default, these are on. And that just means you can use W, S, A, and D like you can with just about any first-person shooter. It's very convenient. But I will throw this out there. It, it will be worth your while, probably, to switch this off and just leave it to when the right mouse button is held. Uh, this way, you can go ahead and turn your mouse around anyway. So if you want to do something like circle strafe around a central target, it's a lot easier to do. You would have had to have hold, uh, held the right mouse button to do this in any event. Because if you don't, for instance, if I set this all the way back to just the default, I'm just waggling the cursor around, but that's not helping me. So if you want true first-person shooter control, you need to be holding right mouse anyway. Well, if you're holding right mouse anyway, if you go ahead and set this, you do a couple of important things. One, you make it just a little bit harder to accidentally nudge the view when you're not meaning to, but you also open up some hotkeys for use later that uh, otherwise are closed off to you unless you're holding Alt. So for instance, if I hit the W key right now, I can hide out all of the static meshes in my level. If I don't have this setting on, for instance, if I had the default use WASD for camera controls, I have to actually hit Alt-W to do that. So for me, it's just a personal preference. I like using those only when right mouse is down. I do like the control. It is very nice to do. Uh, but just using right mouse just gives me the, the kind of control that I want. Now there's a couple of other buttons here that are extremely useful. We have Q and E. Those lift you up and down. They're not like leaning, so there is no pointing around a corner to shoot something. That's not why we're here just yet. And then you also have the ability to zoom and de-zoom. So it's going to zoom in and zoom out. Uh, C is going to zoom you in. Z is going to zoom you out. So if you just want to look at a specific point in the distance, like you can zoom in on the sun if you want to, and then zoom way out and get a really giant field of view. As soon as you release your mouse button, though, that's going to stop. So uh, just to kind of give everybody a heads up, if you're still using the default controls, those just kind of work as long as you're holding the key. Another reason I kind of like just setting these only to right mouse buttons is as long as I'm holding right mouse, I can just tap it and hold that level of zoom. And then when I'm done, just release the mouse button and we snap back. So those are our big navigation keys. Now, for the most part, when I'm working inside of 
UDK. I'm using the left mouse and right mouse buttons to kind of move around. Occasionally, I will use WSA and D to fly from one location to the other. So I really kind of go back and forth. I don't necessarily just pick one and ignore all others. OK, so that is the, the basics of navigating our view. If you are completely new to UDK, if you've never played with this before, you will want to take a minute and make sure you are completely comfortable with navigating these views around. Because if you're not, uh, then it will be really difficult to follow along or do much of anything, because you will get lost in these views. I do want to mention this. If you have an object selected, which you can select just by clicking on something, and it doesn't matter what you select in this case, if you tap the home key, you're going to zoom up, up on that object, uh, which if you get lost, that can be really, really handy. Uh, if you have nothing selected and you hit home, nothing's actually going to happen. So do be aware of that. You've got to select something. Okay, okay, so, so there's, there's our, our basics, basics for navigation. navigation. Now, now just, just another, another kind of, kind of quick, quick run through of the interface moving on from here. Each one of these viewports that you see has its very own toolbar. And I'm going to slide this out of the way just to kind of make sure I have all the windows, I'm sorry, all the buttons available for my toolbar. The same thing gets repeated for each and every to uh, toolbar for each viewport. So I'm just going to cover the one. Of course, it'll kind of reach over for everybody. First off, we have an options window. I'm not going to go into every single thing this does, but it allows us to control what we see out of this viewport at any given time. We can change all kinds of things here. A lot of this stuff is actually already slaved to either hotkeys on the keyboard or buttons that already exist on the toolbar. But just about anything you would need to adjust here in the viewport in terms of what you do and don't see is available here inside this options dropdown. And it's kind of innocuous. It's just this little down arrow key. So uh, make sure that you are aware that that's there. Next, Next, you can change, change the viewport type. type. This, so of course, just changes you between perspective, which is P, T, which is the top view. Now, now notice this top view looks kind of useless, useless at the moment. Uh, that's because it's currently in lit mode, and I'll talk about the modes here in just a moment. We have a front view, and we have a side view. I'm going to be leaving this in perspective for pretty much the whole video. Uh, we, uh, have we have the ability to switch this to real-time real mode. Now, now in, in this, this case, the only thing that's going to do is make the clouds move. If you have any animated, animated elements, such as animated textures or things that should be waggling around in your scene, uh, turning on real-time view will help that out. Now, we, next to here, we have all of our different viewport modes. I'm not going to go into all of the details for these, but what these allow you to do, in essence, is just change the way you're visualizing the world. Some of the more important ones you'll be using are brush wireframe and wireframe, which are going to look very similar at the moment. Um, unlit, which allows you to see the world without any lighting getting in your way, which is going to look really flat at the moment, because we're pretty much relying solely on lighting to see what's what. Of course, we have lit mode. And then we have lighting only. If we had any textures applied, this would hide those textures. But again, that's going to be a little hard to visualize. There are others as well. We have light complexity. It's just a way to see how many lights you have affecting any given object. Texture density, which is showing you how much texture information is on each individual surface. Shader complexity, same thing. It's just allowing you to see how complex your shaders are. These are really mostly for level optimization, uh, so that you can take a quick look and see if there are any areas of your level that, you're, that are really eating away at your overall performance. So they're, they're, they're kind, kind of like, like uh, visual, visual debugging, debugging, if you want to look at it that way. And then we have light map density as well, which, uh, again, would be the same thing. It's just a way to debug how dense our light map is going to be. If you have no idea what a light map is, don't worry. That just means that you're young enough in UDK that it's not going to be that important to you just yet. Now, moving next to here, we have game mode. The neat thing about game mode is it allows you to see what the, this would look like if you were actually playing the game without actually playing the game. Now, it has a few exceptions. Some things will only work at runtime if you set up any special uh, scenarios via scripting or whatnot. But visually speaking, it hides away things like icons and all the stuff that you don't need. If you combine this with real time, so if you turn on real time mode and game mode, for the most part, this looks pretty much exactly like what your game is going to look like. Now, next is we have a few special features we're not going to dig into too much. Uh, we've got the ability to lock our viewport or lock a selected actor to the camera. Very useful if you need to uh, position a light kind of by looking through it or if you want to uh, use the viewport to move an object around, but not something we're going to explore too much right now. 
if we were handling any level streaming, again, kind of outside the scope, but if we were doing that, we can visualize it here. Uh, we have the ability to look at any post-process volumes. Now, that is something I do want to touch on a little bit later today, uh, time willing, so you'll be able to see what this button does. Then you have your camera movement speed. This is pretty handy if you're using those WASD controls and you want to control how fast you're moving. So if you feel like you're moving too slow, you can click on this and start to speed things up. Click on it again and go even faster. And you can max it out and you're just screaming like you're on fire. Or just leave it at the standard slow. So if you need faster controls, this is where you can get that. Uh, finally, you have play and viewport, which is pretty straightforward. Hit play and... Now, now we're, we're actually, actually playing. playing. So, so I'm using WASD to move around. I can hit space to jump. jump. So, so it's really just, just like playing a game. game. And when, when I'm, I'm done, done, just hit escape. Now, now I'm going to throw, throw this out for anybody who's following along. along. This, this is something, something that's happening on my computer. computer whether or not it happens, happens on yours, yours I, can't I can't say. say. But, but as, as soon as I hit escape and get out of there, my mouse is currently locked to the top of my editor. To stop that, just hit Alt-Tab and tab, tab out of and back into UDK. UDK. It's, it's a little bit annoying, but it's, it's there. And uh, just, just so, so you, you know, know, that's, that's not just you. you. That's, that's lots of folks. folks. All right, right now, now the couple of other things we have, we can tear off a window or we can just make a window full screen, screen which is something that is very nice, nice but, but I'm going to try not to do it too terribly much, much just because of video encode, encode sizes. sizes. So that's so a quick rundown of the, of the toolbar here. Now, now the reason I showed you that is because I really want you to be aware of that. I won't be going into that level of detail for absolutely everything. But let's, but let's move around the interface, interface real quick and take a look at a few other things. things. First, First off, we, we have, have a menu, menu bar. bar. You've, You've seen, seen these in all kinds of apps. apps. You have things like your file menu for opening and closing things, uh, your, your edit menu, menu for undo, undo cut, copy, paste, paste, along with some other stuff as well, help, help you find actors and whatnot, but I'm not going to go into every single command. View is going to allow you to control what you do and don't see. Of particular importance here under view are things like world properties, which is something we're going to have to take a look at a little bit later. Next, Next, you have, you have some, some brush, brush controls, controls in the brush, brush menu. menu. I, don't I don't think I ever really use this menu because, because everything I need to do to a brush, brush is already available in the toolbox on the left-hand side of the screen, screen but, but if they're, they're all the same. same. You have you play controls. controls. Again, Again, something I don't find myself using very often because all of this stuff is already available in a toolbar. The tools menu has some specialized tools for controlling various things like the old-school terrain system or cleaning up BSP materials, but not something you're probably going to spend a whole lot of time in. Your preferences, Your preferences is exactly, exactly that. that. Just, Just things, things that you can, can switch, switch on and off to control how your, uh, your UDK is working. working. So, so for instance, if you don't want to have separate move, rotate, and scale tools, you can turn, tools, you can turn on, on the combined, combined one. one. And there's, there's all, all kinds of various options, options so you can turn, turn on and off. off. Finally, Finally, I have help. help. Uh, this, this is going to do a couple things. One, it'll open up the UDN, which is very nice to, you know, if you're looking for specific information about something. Also, Keep, Keep in, in mind, mind that, that you've got, got the Unreal Development Kit over here and about, and that'll, and that'll tell you exactly what version you're running. So, uh, and, that, and that's important, especially with UDK getting a new build pretty much every month. Uh, it's, uh, it's important, important for you to be able to know what version you're running at pretty, pretty much any given time, time because if something ever goes wrong and you report it or post about it on a forum, probably the very next response you're going to get is, hey, what version are you running? So definitely be aware of that. All right, down from here, we have the main toolbar. I do a lot of work just using this toolbar. So let's take a quick run through from left to right. First off, we have our new button. You click on this and you can create a brand new level. Uh, this is something we're going to be doing a little bit later, but I'll just go ahead and click on, say, night lighting. And, uh, and we get a, a wonderful uh, feature of UDK. Don't worry, though. We're just going to go ahead and close it. And it's probably hiding. There we go. So I'll just double click and bring up a new UDK. All right. right. And, uh, uh, lazy crap, so if there's a way to mute me. Yes, yes just close out of the webinar altogether. altogether. Um, uh, just take, take a, go to webinar and just close it out, and that will mute me very, very efficiently. Uh, so, so moving, moving across from here, here, we've got, uh, new, we've got open, pretty, pretty standard stuff. stuff. Uh, uh, next to this, you have some recents. If you've been working, you can just grab anything you want. Uh, uh, now, now, moving, moving down, down from here, here let me get that out of my way. Come here, you. Uh, you've, uh, you've got, got things, things like save, save, save all if you have multiple levels, levels open, which is more available with uh, level streaming. streaming. You can you save any package you have open. open. You have you undo, undo, redo. I don't, I don't know why you would ever use these as buttons, because I think all of you, as responsible 3D application users, and UDK is just a 3D application like any other, you should be completely programmed to hit Control-Z whenever anything goes wrong. So just keep that in mind. 
Next, Next we have, we have various, various uh, transformation, transformation modes, modes. And, we'll and we'll talk a little bit about, about these moving forward, forward. but we have the ability, ability to just, just select, select or, or we can, can uh, move, move, rotate, rotate scale, scale, or scale, scale non-uniformly. Uh, uh, we, we can, can change, change the axis, axis on which we are doing any of these operations. operations. So, so if we uh, yeah, set this back over to move, move, I can I move can locally or I can move in world coordinates, coordinates uh, whichever floats my boat. I can I search for actors in my level. level. So if you click this, you'll, you'll get a, a list of everything, everything in your level, level which is extremely convenient if you know what it is you're looking for. If you don't know what you're looking for, it's really just a list of information. It means pretty much nothing to you. But if you know you need a light, you can just come in here and click light. Or, or type, type out light, light, excuse me, and press enter, enter. And, it'll and it'll automatically filter, filter down your list, list and now we can see the lights in my scene. scene. Extremely, Extremely convenient. convenient. Uh, but, but again, if, if you're, you're just getting, getting started and you don't know what your names are, are then, uh, then yeah. yeah. Now somebody, somebody said, I'm, I'm not, not getting, getting any widgets, widgets in perspective. perspective. I'm just going to throw this out real quick. One, make sure you have something selected. Two, make sure you're not in selection mode. Uh, because, because selection mode will hide away your widgets so that you don't have them. That's kind of the point. It's so that if anybody else sits down to your UDK install, they don't accidentally start nudging things, or so that you don't accidentally start nudging things. And moving on from here, we have some specialized parts of the interface. Uh, which, uh, which are very, very important, important, and I, I, mean, I can't stress, stress their importance, importance enough. enough. We, have we have the content, content browser. browser. The content, the content browser, browser is where you're going to find all of the bits and pieces and things that you want to add, add to your level. You can, you can find things like textures, materials, uh, particle, particle effects, effects, sound effects, effects static, static meshes, meshes, all kinds of stuff. stuff. Anything that you want to add to your level to make it in any way interesting is going, is going to be available inside, inside the content, content browser. browser. Now, now, I could take an entire lesson, lesson like a giant lesson, like 30 minutes or more, and just talk about the content browser. For now, it's important enough for you to know that really the reason for its existence is to make it easy for you to search for a particular type of game asset, maybe just like a mesh or something, and give you an easy way to add it into your level. Four instances. Uh, uh, over here, here at the, the very, very top, top, I have all of the filters, filters that allow me to kind of narrow down, down what I'm looking, looking for. for. So, so if I set, set this to static meshes, meshes and make sure, sure I'm looking under UDK game over here on the lower left-hand left corner, corner, then I can, I can see, see all of the static, static meshes, meshes that exist inside, inside these folders. These folders. So, so I can grab maybe remade physics barrel, then right-click over here on the ground, and let's, let's, it's probably not loaded up right now, so I'm going to need to make sure if I go to add actor, We'll just, we'll just say, say load, load static, static mesh, mesh etc. Et so if I click, I click that, that, that ends up getting loaded, loaded in. So now, now I can say, say right click again and say, say load, load static, static mesh. mesh. And we have, we have a barrel. barrel. Fantastic. Fantastic. So that's just, just kind of a really, really quick, quick example, example of using, using the content, content browser. browser. You're just going to find, find interesting things and add them into your level. Now, next to the button for the content browser, we have Unreal Kismet. This is Unreal's visual scripting system. So if you don't mind, go and turn off real time, maybe jump back to four for you. Am um, I, I driving, driving people crazy? crazy? Well, uh, I'm just thinking about, about yeah. Yeah. Streaming, streaming it on. Perfect. Perfect. All right, back, back over to Kismet. Kismet. All right, so, so the Kismet, Kismet editor is something we're going to take a look at a little bit later today, but this is the heart of the visual scripting system inside of Unreal, uh, which is going to be huge for those of you who are not programmers but still want to make cool things happen in your game. This is where you can uh, create your events, et cetera, and so forth. Now, now, we have the ability to open up Unreal matinee, matinee as well, but if I click this, we're not going to get anything, because it says no matinee sequences exist right, right now. So, so that's, that's okay. okay. We're just going to ignore that. We don't really need that at the moment. moment. We, we have, have a slider, slider for the, the far clipping plane. plane. This, this is, is really, really only important, important if your level is so dense that it's starting to really bog your system down. down. But what, what this does is it controls a clipping plane out in the distance that chops away what's far away from you, which can be really handy if, if, again, again you're, you're, maybe you're doing like a giant city level, level and things are so dense that uh, you're just having a hard time moving around without a little bit of sluggishness or anything like that, you can control that clipping plane. Or maybe just for focus, if you just don't want to look at stuff that's out in the distance. So I need to a quick question. Said, is there another way to program not visual scripting? Sure. You can use Unreal Script, which I think Nelson just typed at the same time I said that. All right, All right, next, next we, have we have some selection, selection commands. We, we, have we have the ability to allow translucent selection. selection. We're not going to worry too much about that at the moment. Um, then we have, we have the ability to control whether or not things that are selected have to be completely inside of a box, or they can just be uh, in part of a box. Box selection, for those of you who like do marquee selections a lot, that's just holding control and alt at the same time, and you can drag with your mouse. So if I want to select these objects, like or if I want to select that barrel again, control, alt, drag out a box. 
Now, now next, next to, this, to this, we have, we have our, our build, build controls. controls. Now, now building, building is huge. Building, building is one of the most important things you're going to be doing in your level. level. Uh, it's uh, one of those things where, where, where as, you as you start, start to, get to get further along in your, in your level, level, as it starts to begin to get more advanced and more detailed, building will probably take some time. Now, what do I mean when I say building? Basically, it means calculating. Uh, if, uh, if you, you have, have any BSP, BSP brushes, brushes in your level, level. if you don't you even know what those are, are don't, don't stress it. We're going to create, create some and you'll see what they do. Uh, uh, BSP, BSP brushes, brushes can be rebuilt, rebuilt to create your basic level, level geometry. geometry. We'll talk, talk more about that later. later. Uh, you uh, can you build, build any lighting, lighting in your level. level. So, so if you've if added, added any lights, lights you've, you've got, got to build that lighting so that Unreal can create the final lighting and shadow maps. That's huge. As a matter of fact, if we make some changes to this level, I think even just adding that static mesh would do it. And, and I hit, I hit play. play, we get a big warning here that says lighting, lighting needs to be rebuilt. rebuilt. So, I mean, we, we could, could do that. that. Um, it, it may take, take just a moment. What I'm going to do is hit control tab, tab and then shift tab, tab to, to jump, jump in and jump, jump back out of Unreal. Unreal. So, so if, if I, I just, just click, click on, on build, build lighting, lighting and, we and we get some options, I'm just going to click OK. All kinds of stuff is actually going to happen. The building map window will pop up and Unreal Swarm is going to fire up, which is a distributed light map building process. And you see, this actually takes just a moment, and our audio might be doing some weird things right now if all of the cores of our machine are being eaten up right now. And this is taking a lot longer to build than I wanted to, but there we go. Yeah, I mean, we are kind of... Yeah, <laughs> the poor machine. Yeah, we're doing all kinds of stuff on this uh, computer right now. But now we've rebuilt lighting, so now if we hit play, everything is copacetic. So just, so just keep in mind, mind that building, building lighting, lighting is something you're going to be doing a whole lot. lot. If you if have, have any navigation, navigation system set up to get, help your bots get around, you can rebuild their paths. Uh, you, uh, can you can also build cover nodes. nodes. That's kind of a Gears of War thing. If you remember, Gears of War had a lot of places where you could take cover. This is kind of how that system worked. And then if you want to, you can do what I generally do, which is build all. This builds your geometry and your lighting together as well as your paths. Next, Next, we can, we can choose, choose the degree, degree of accuracy we, we want our lighting, lighting to take. Now, if now, you see the little tiny eyeball next to your light bulb, that means you're in preview mode. mode. That's the fastest build you can get away with. Um, if you click on this, you can set it to medium, you can set it to high, or you can set it to production. If you set this to production and click build lighting, get comfy, go get coffee, walk away for a while. Um, it will make your uh, will stop giving you warnings. It's generally a good thing to do when you're finished with your level, and you want to see what it's going to look like because you are ready to actually export it. Until then, though, you can probably just get away with preview to have a general idea of what your lighting is doing. Please keep that in mind. If you click on full screen mode, you're going to get rid of your little Windows bar across the top. So if that's getting on your nerves, just click that. It's also a slave to F11, and I do find myself hitting that a lot on my home install. You can, you can toggle, toggle real-time real audio. audio if you have any uh, sounds, sounds set up in your level and you want to hear them while you're moving around inside the editor, you can turn this on and those will be available. I currently have no sound, so it doesn't really matter. And we have some mobile and playback features. Now, the great thing about UDK is it does allow for development on mobile devices, specifically iOS. So if you want to emulate what mobile is going to work or what a mobile level would actually look like, you can click this, and it's going to take a minute to compile all of your shaders. Basically, what it's doing is saying, OK, you want to see what this looks like on a mobile device. So what I need to do is recompile everything with that in mind. Now, this will probably take just a second, so I do ask that you bear with me. And, and as of right, right now, yes, I believe it is strictly iOS. I don't, I don't think, think they've got Android, Android support just, just yet, but I'm sure that that's something that uh, will be coming up soon. Now, there now, is Flash support if you have, if you're an actual, actual licensee. licensee. Um, a UDK, UDK person, person doesn't, doesn't get, get uh, uh, Flash support, support unfortunately. Uh, somebody uh, so said, is there a reason they got, got rid of the gun when entering game mode? And I feel, I feel like it's like in the same perspective as it used to be. Well, well Jason, Jason, to answer, answer your question, question if, if I was in Epic Shoes, shoes I would have got rid of the gun, gun too. Because, because I don't I want people, or I wouldn't want people, people to think that UDK is strictly about, about making first-person first shooters. There's, there's all kinds of things you can do with UDK that aren't even necessarily, i got to use finger quotes, game-related. You can do visualization. You can do architectural kind of stuff. If you want to show off a brand new building that you've been working on to you know some clients who are going to either pay for a building contract or not, then you don't necessarily want a great big cannon hanging off the side of the screen, which, okay, oh, some of us was about to say. I mean, I think it's pretty cool, but not everybody does. There are those folks who would sit there in the boardroom, and their nose would kind of start to curl, and they'd be like, well, I don't think we should be shooting in our building. And it looks like this is actually taking a little longer than I wanted it to, but 
probably, probably because, because I, clicked I clicked it once on my computer, computer and went through this, and then after that point, everything was okay. I'm kind of tempted to actually pause our video. Yeah, you can hit pause on it. I'm just going to hit pause. Let me get done this and we finish. Pause. So yeah, this is taking a whole moment. <laughs> Somebody in the fall says, hey boss, we designed the flat cannon proof building. Well, yes, but you did. Okay, we are back. And once we've uh, established emulate mobile features mode, this is what the level would look like on a mobile device. So several things have been simplified. You'll notice the sky looks a whole lot more basic. Uh, the lighting isn't quite as gorgeous as it was five seconds ago. Uh, we don't have things like the sun shafts and all of that. Um, our textures are much more basic. So this is a clearer idea of what this would look like over on some sort of mobile device. Now for now, I'm going to go ahead and turn this off. And I won't be clicking any more of these buttons, but I'm going to show you kind of what they do. If you have an iOS device already set up with UDK, which is not something I'm going to explore here before you start asking, uh, you can take what you built and send it over there to test it out. Uh, you, uh, can, you, you have, have a mobile, mobile previewer, previewer, which will kind of do everything we just saw a second ago, but then it'll open up a special window that gives you some clickable touch controls so that you can kind of see how your game is responding. Uh, you can change the settings for that. You can start this level on the PC, uh, which is just kind of like bringing up a special play-in window. We have yeah, enable kismet, kismet debugging. debugging. Not, Not something I'm really going to explore, explore right now, but it's very cool because you can establish stop points along a visual scripting sequence. That's right, Nelson. There's, there's, there's visual scripting. scripting. And, uh, and, uh, and when there's an error, error, you can actually bump in and see where problems exist, which is pretty cool. cool. And then and finally, we have, we have our play button, button which just allows us to see what the game looks like in a giant window, which I'm not going to leave that going for very long. Uh, just, uh, just because, because of the video side. And, uh, and uh, just, to just to let you guys, you guys know, know because, because we're doing, doing the best we can to answer questions, questions but the questions, questions panel is on a 27-inch uh, monitor, and, and questions are just are flying in. in. So it's really what Zach, Zach can capture, capture from time to time, time but we, we just had a flood, flood of people, people that said that uh, recording is still paused. No, Zach started it back. No, yeah, we're doing good. Wow, so many of you guys were quick on I have done that before, though. It was embarrassing, but I have done it. All right, so this leads us to, like, the second to the last area I want to talk about. And I'm going to kind of keep this relatively brief. Uh, this is the toolbox over on the left-hand side of the view. Starting at the very top, you have the various modes that you can put the editor into. Some of these are fairly redundant, but we'll get to that. We have camera mode. That's your default mode. That's sort of the I just want to use UDK, leave me alone mode. Uh, we, uh, have we have our, our geometry, geometry mode. mode. This allows, allows us to readjust the shape of BSP brushes, brushes which we, we are going to use a little bit later today. today. Terrain, terrain editing mode is a part, a part of the old school terrain, terrain system, which is being phased out. out. Um, and uh, and now, it may remain for a while due to legacy issues, and I'm sure it will. They won't want to completely destroy backwards compatibility. But the more recent way to build landscapes is with landscape mode. Uh, which, uh, which is something, is something that, we that we will be taking a look at later today. today. We have we texture have alignment mode, which allows you to uh, manually place textures on the surface. Uh, uh, mesh, mesh paint, paint mode for vertex, vertex painting. painting. Static, static mesh, mesh mode, which allows you to specifically work, work with static, with static to them, uh, such as rotation or not, before they're edited into a level. It's not to them, uh, uh, such as rotation or not, before they're edited into a level. It's not something you're probably going to have to add all the time, but it is convenient. Which allows you to paint down grasses. And then we have foliage mode, which allows you to paint down grasses and plants and things like that. Extremely useful. These buttons Next, all we have brushes. On the red builder now, brush, these red buttons all specifically work view. on the red an builder brush, which is this red block they're sitting in the middle of your view. An interesting thing that Epic has done here, they're, they're doing something, dishonest. it's almost because you see your almost red a head job. It's cube. almost dishonest. Because you see a red builder brush surrounding this little cube, but that cube is just a static mesh. If this I can grab the, the move brush, tool and I move this guy up, use these buttons to change this is the red builder brush, and now I can the use these buttons to change its shape. Now the red builder brush is just giving you a preview and then you of can each shape that you click, an additive or subtractive piece. And then of you can choose now whether or not this needs right to be an additive or subtractive piece of geometry. Now those words right there probably scared a few of you in the room. What does he mean when he says additive or subtractive? As somebody says, how is he seeing the vertices? Well, for me, the vertices were just. As somebody says, how is he seeing the vertices? Default. Well, for me, the vertices uh, I'm were not just sure how to simply them on by default. Off the top of my head. Uh, I'm not actually uh, sure how to switch really those. Off. To work with them, just off the top of my head. Mode anyway. uh, if you so really I'm needed really to work with them, you'd, you'd be in geometry mode anyway. So I really wouldn't stress it. If you're in a situation where you don't see the vertices, I don't think that's going to really change or bother anyone. Without going into a great big lecture about this, okay. Now, without going into a great big lecture about this, because I realize that I'm probably already opening up the BSP. 
the uh, discussions, and I don't really want to get too uh, far into that. Levels, it is okay to use BSP. Uh, for the most part, for your levels, you will be using mostly here static or meshes, or but using a BSP brush uh, we'll here, be using them today for yeah, simplicity's sake, so that I don't have to. We'll be using them today for simplicity's sake, so that I don't have to get you guys to all install Maya and learn how to model with these buttons, which would just be way too time consuming. All right, so all of these buttons, all they really do is change the shape of the red builder brush. Now you can right click on these buttons and punch in some values. So for instance, if I right click on the cube brush, we can say we want a brush that is 512 units in X, 512 units in Y, and 36 units in Z. And there we go. We have a nice little flat area. I could move this off to the side, set it right above the ground, We'll close out this Let's window. See. We'll set it right above the ground over here and this inside view. Next we'll and close out this window. CSG and this these leads me to my next little panel. Something. And these are the, the CSG commands. You can use it to these allow you to do to something with the red builder brush. You can use it to add geometry to the world. We can also use it to subtract. So have a block so of geometry just sitting there. We can also use it to subtract. So to show that off, what I'm going to do is go back up to the cube. And I'm going to right click on it. And instead of 512, let's do 256 by 256. Like so. can click build it. And just go ahead and it doesn't matter at this point, it's already smaller built. Red you can click build it. makes you feel better. But you can see we do have a much smaller red builder brush. But watch this. I can click the subtract button now and chop that back out. And earlier when I said additive or subtractive geometry, that's what I was talking about. Uh, I have one brush that is adding into the world so just a, and another brush which is subtracting. Keep in mind. Now somebody said, are those units centimeters? Kind of concept, just unreal units. Now somebody said, are those units centimeters? Actually, those are just unreal kind of units. They are their you. very own thing. But we'll How you convert them is kind of up to uh, you. So that but sort of I will just kind of throw this out brush. there. That is uh, just so that everybody is sort of on the level. If I make a brush by 16 units, that is, say, we'll let's just say 16 units by 16 units, and then we'll go 128. I'm going to do something very carefully here. I'm going to build and close that. I'm going to do something very carefully here. I'm going to drag this out to the side, and I'm going to set this right down on top of the ground. Exactly. I'm going to do it with a hotkey. And I want to add it just the way we added the brush a moment ago. I'm going to do it with a hotkey this time. We're going to hit Control A. That would be Control. Alternatively, if I wanted no, to S subtract it, that would level. be Control S. Um, so no, really Control S does not control save your level. You are going to be very um, if you're, if you're really used to hitting Control S to save, you are going to be very frustrated with Unreal Ed because that means every time you hit this, you're you're just subtracting. Uh, you're said, not uh, actually saving. Use additive or subtractive in the level. Uh, if you uh, are somebody said, uh, can you use additive or subtractive in a level? Back in the uh, if you are an old school Unreal Ed user, level. I mean, back in the day, you could have a purely subtractive level, meaning you had a level that was basically solid, solid space and you're carving out like you're building ca like a cave network inside of a mountain or something. It's not that way anymore. It is always a giant space of emptiness and you are adding in the surfaces for your level. Okay, so check this out. I made a 128 unit tall. Okay, so check this out. I made a 128 and I just unit want to walk tall Notice pillar that thing. from our camera perspective, and I just want to walk up to it. Notice that from our camera perspective, that that's um, about as tall as I am. Standard height. I just want to throw that out there. Um, the standard height of your character in UDK so is 128 kind of, uh, units tall. Uh, so if you're trying to find a way to kind of, uh, that's how you can do it. So I guess normalize your overall scale. That's how you can do it. So if, if you decided that your character was about six feet tall, that means one foot is like twenty. Just something to keep in mind. Point if you're some to odd unreal scale. units. Just something to keep in mind. Right, if you're so trying to build something to scale. We've got a couple of other CSG operations here. We have the ability to. All right, so we've got a couple of other CSG operations here. We have the ability to CSG intersect and de intersect. I love that word. That's so. Amazing. Well, it's actually kind of annoying. But that's okay. We won't stress about that. Watch how they work. Let me do 128 build by 128 by 16. So what I have build is the red close. builder brush passing through this little pillar. And what I'm so what I have is, is the red builder brush passing through this little pillar. And, and what, what I'm going to do is just press... Unreal intersect. Notices and watch what that we're passing through another brush, and it just gives us Unreal the notices that we're passing through another brush, and it just gives so us the result of that's what the two intersections. So wherever those two brushes exist, that's what we end up with. So that's exist, that's that's exactly what we end up with. Ta-da! Which is very good if I happen to need a brush that's exactly that size. Do watch out, though. You don't necessarily want to do this if you have a really complex shape. For simple stuff like, you know, subtracting or intersecting one cube out of another, hey, no big deal. It's great. But for more complex shapes, you don't want to do that. Also, 
uh, generally speaking, uh, you don't ever want to have complex shapes made out of ESP anyway. Uh, anytime you can, get a, you can get away with it, just use cubes or maybe the very occasional simple cylinder. But a lot of these other things, like uh, cones, especially spheres and staircases, you will probably never, ever, ever, ever use, especially staircases. If you're making stairs, 99 times out of 100, you should be using... Uh, a static okay, mesh. So now, uh, the other thing I wanted to show real quick was just D-intersection. So okay, so now, uh, the other thing I wanted to show real quick was just D-intersection. So I'm just going to left-click my cube brush to reset it back to where it was. And now if I hit D-intersect, take a look. we got a much more complicated brush. I would not recommend you ever did this, but take a look at what our result is. It's basically everything else. It is the red builder brush minus the section inside where that uh, column exists. There it is anyway. Not something I would find myself using very often, but... There it is anyway. So I can add it and you can see kind of what the down from here we have some visibility controls. So I'm gonna undo it. We can choose things like now down from here we have some visibility controls. We can choose things like we can show only what is selected or hide what is selected. We can invert a selection. So if I select uh I don't have too much to sitting over here. If I grab maybe I can that barrel, which has just been sitting over here all patient. I can I can say invert selection. That'll select everything but the barrel. I can just hide that barrel if I want to. So just a way to show and hide. Or we can just click show all and Finally, show everybody. Finally, we can go so to a specific actor. Just a way to show and hide. To the red things. builder brush. Finally, we can go to a specific actor or go to the red builder brush. Go to the red builder brush. Actually, find is pretty useful. Select an you just click on it. It'll jump you right to it. Which we could have done using. Or you can select an actor. Just click go to actor. Which we could have done using search for actor in order to. And just click go to actor. That's the same as hitting the home key. That's save you a lot of work. One last thing about the red builder brush, which can save you a lot of work and a lot of hunting, is if you have an object selected. Uh, and you, you just kind of build a new builder brush. No, oh, it's not it will uh, If you just kind of click on one of your CSG it buttons, it will create the builder brush. It'll move it over here to the location of whatever you had selected. So if you're like really, like really far, far away from it at some other like spot really in the level, maybe I'm over here where the player start is, and I'm just like, I really wish I had the red builder brush like right here. I can just click on this object and build a cube, and there it is, right there in front of me, which is extremely convenient. All right, now, finally, across the bottom, we have the console bar. All right, now, finally, across the bottom, area. we have the console On the far bar. left, we have uh, This is a pretty useful little area. On the far left, we have some console command fields where we can enter uh, console next commands. Next to this, we have the ability to really see if certain much. things are working. Now, uh, next to this, we have the ability to see if certain things like are working. Now, currently, we're not co uh, connected to source control, but if you have, so like, a Perforce uh, account, you could actually set that up so that Unreal Ed could reach over to Perforce. Now, I clicked that, and it's... Oh, there we go. I figured it would come in soon. Or later. That's not something so if you have Perforce, you can establish uh, you a connection there. That's not something we're ever going to really get into. Uh, you get a little out. warning down here. And I gotta you watch out because my uh, Windows bar will kind of fly up. This will tell you when you need to rebuild right lighting, and you can just and click it to save some time. Save with paths right next to it. And this will also tell you if you have any packages that need to check out. Now we're not going to worry too much about packages, but I did see one question pop up about this earlier. The easiest way to think of a package is it's just kind of like a assets. It can hold things like folder textures, that like holds materials. some stuff. Like it can hold various it's assets. Really it can just hold a things a like textures, things. like materials, like static meshes. It's but really just a, a collection uh, of things. Can you rebind the keys? I've never actually. No, had somebody to do else asked, uh, "Can you rebind the keys?" I've never actually had to do that, uh, so I've, I can't I be the one to answer right this second. Rebinding keys, then I. Uh, I've, I often find like that if I start rebinding keys, then I end up with problems when trying to teach people things. Yes, there can be. Can there be only one builder brush at a time? Yes, there can be only one builder brush at a time. It's kind of like the highlight. Except that it really is immortal because you can't ever get rid of it. As a matter of fact, if you get tired of seeing your builder brush, really your only hope is to maybe make a cube builder brush with scales of zero, and then it'll still take. Be there, things, but it'll be so small it won't get By using a subtractive brush in the center of the floor. Now, some other things. Let's see. Wow. By using a subtractive brush in the center of the floor. Now, the reason for that is. that also get rid of the collision? Yes. Now, the reason for that is uh, is kind of twofold. Let me hit play here. They kind of limit my jump here, so I'm going to do think, something. No, I don't use think console, I can jump that the high. They kind of limit my jump here, so I'm going to do something. We're going to use console, so I'm going to hit the tilde key and just type ghost. And that'll let me to fly a little bit. So we'll fly up above this guy. So I'm right and on top of it, and then I'll hit oh, tilde wait, again, walk. type ghost again, and back in the old days oh wait, it's walk in these days. So it here works. I am, and if I step in the middle back of this, back in the old days of cheating in Unreal. So here I am, and if I step in the middle of this, I fall. 
Really now the reason for this is that those brushes that I created, on how they're really just the kind of a way to instruct the, the engine on how to create the geometry. To collide or the brushes themselves with. aren't just kind of really there to collide or do anything with. with. They're just kind of definitions that the engine is going to use say, okay, we started with this shape and then we carved this shape out of it. I can kind of show you. If I rebuild my geometry, I'm just going to click on the build geometry button up here. So. And let's switch over to so wireframe. I'm going to click on the build geometry button up here. Look really and let's switch over to wireframe. Because it doesn't work that way. Look but there really closely. I can't select it because it doesn't work that way. But there is a gray box. Let me do this. I can hit W and hide away my static that meshes. Is your you see this gray box with a big donut shape in it? That is your CSG. Your constructive solid geometry, I think is what it stands for. That is the geometry that the engine has actually built based on what you defined with those builder brushes. An additive uh, brush so on the outside, you started off by saying brush. you wanted okay, an additive brush on the outside, then a subtractive make. brush. If I'm going to say, okay, I can make that, there and here's what it ended up making. Up. If I so switch to really brush wireframe, the there are the brushes, the brushes that make are that up. Just, uh, so you're not really colliding with the brushes. The brushes uh, are just uh, instructions. They're adding, but not showing up in perspective. Uh, my brushes uh, aren't showing, like they're adding, but not showing up in perspective. You mean something like this? So you get something that looks kind of like so, but you can't see the brushes for any reason whatsoever? You probably tap which is the Q really key convenient if you because really Q will hide your brushes, you just get them which is them. really convenient if you've got a really cluttered scene you need to just kind of get them uh, out of the So way. let's see, uh, so you cannot have more of them at the same time. Uh, so let's I'm see, uh, sure so them. you cannot have more of them at the same time. I'm not sure what Over them brushes. is. Your red there's a lot of brush, you only have one. Brushes? Builder uh, brushes. You think of him your as red builder like brush, you only have one. What your uh, but you think of him as kind of like the template for what your but additive or subtractive brush is going to look like. For as for like additive brushes and subtractive brushes, you can have as many as you want. And it um, until which you eventually cool. slow down your computer and it explodes. Okay, so which probably be quite that's, uh, I think, a pretty good way to go from here. Are there okay, so that's, I think, a pretty good way to go from here. Are there... I wasn't done with the console bar yet. So scrolling across the console bar, we have some various information. It'll tell us what level we're in. Um, if you are just getting started, this will pretty much only tell you one thing the whole time. As you start working with things like level streaming, uh, so jumping from one level to another dynamically while playing the game, uh, this will tell you which particular level you're looking at, which is extremely useful. Uh, next you have what is currently selected. So each time I select something, you'll notice this area kind of updates to let you know I have this particular actor selected, uh, and it has, in this case, 12 12 triangles, 24 vertices, before, and no sections. An now, if you haven't heard the term actor before, it's really generic an actor just is just something that is placed in your level. It's a really generic term. Just about everything in your Unreal scene is an actor. If it's not an actor, it's just world geometry, meaning uh, this really gray stuff one or the other uh, that we see when you're looking over here. Scene. It's really going to be one or the other for the most part when you're looking All right, at now, a Unreal scene. Uh, Going across from here, we have some scale. All right, now uh, going across from here, we have some barrel, scale real easy adjustments we can make. Uh, and if I find that barrel, these become real easy to use. Your I'm first uh, field drag my barrel up into the air. Global scale. Your so first four. field for this is global scale. X, y, so there's actually four. For those of you who are used to 3D four four applications fields. where you can scale in X, Y, and Z, you might be going, "Oh, are there four fields?" Uniform scale. That's because the first one is kind of like an automatic uniform scale. And I'm not entirely sure why. Just a screen. I can't actually right. select this, and I'm not entirely sure why. It's probably just a screen uh, resolution the thing. Because uh, I think but it's overlapping end, with uh, the info field right there. Uh, but on your end, end, if you're running this at a decent resolution, uh, then you can axis. click on that first Next field, and that will allow you to scale uniformly in all three axes. Next, you have draw scale X, Y, Z independently. So if we take Z and set it to 2, we get a very tall barrel. Now moving down from here, we Just have as a, for a very important part of the interface. Now moving if down from here, we have a very important unreal. part of the interface. Please if you are new to Unreal, snapping is please really, keep really this in mind. You snapping is really, really important. At all times. You generally it always want to snap at all times. Brushes, it just makes things much neater, exactly especially together. when you're working with BSP brushes. If BSP brushes aren't snapped problems. exactly together, so that can lead to errors and on. problems. So I would always leave your snaps area, on. Now here's how they work. Grid snapping. Your drag on the left-hand side of this, this area, you have your you grid snapping, your, your drag snapping. grid. This allows you to control your snapping. This allows us to control how we snap when we are moving an object. This allows us to control how we snap when we are moving an object. So currently this is set to 8. If I set this to 64, we are snapping in increments of 64 units. And it almost looks like we're not snapping. 
We can set it, we all set all it down as low as two, and it almost looks like we're not snapping. We can set it all the way down to one, and then we really don't feel like we're snapping. Or if we switch it off, then we really are not snapping at all. Now use that to your advantage if you need to. If you have a static mesh that needs to be placed just so, and snapping isn't getting you what you want, by all means, turn it off. I like to use snapping for pretty much everything. A lot of the meshes that come with UDK are built in a modular fashion, meaning that they are probably designed uh, so in some like scale that is a multiple of 16, so there'll be something like 256 units wide, or 128 units, wide, really nice or 128 so units tall, like or things that can be snapped to that really nice and easily so they fit together like pieces of a puzzle. That will make your level, design, like make your level design, design process a whole lot faster, and I do recommend uh, if you're building modular things, things like, like walkways, set, or that you build uh, anything that you want to be able to put together kind of like a train set, that you build to a unit value like that, something you can snap to and quickly just start bolting meshes together. Now if that overwhelms you and that, that, that information is kind of like, oh, I don't even know what you're later talking about. On, That's okay. That just means you're still kind of new to things. Yeah, and later on, you'll, you'll come back and look at this video and remember that I said that and be like, the oh, next I, I remember who's talking about now. Snapping as well. called the, the next one is we have our rotation precise. snapping as well. It's called the rotation the grid to, to be precise. And Notice this allows you to control really the degree to which you are uh, rotating. Notice like it's got some really weird values in it uh, by three. default. You can, uh, we have like 2.81 degree snaps, 5.63. You can uh, snap to 45 degrees if you want to. Tool. And how this works is if I tap the space bar to get out my rotation tool, it just controls what we're snapping to. I pretty much always leave that on because I think 99 times out of 100. I pretty much always leave that on because I think 99 times out of 100, I've got to snap to something like 45 degrees or 90 degrees. All right now, next to this, we have scale snapping. Same thing. It's just. All right now, next to this, we have scale snapping. Same thing. It's just controlling what percentage you want to snap to. So if we set this say up to 25, then as I scale. We are always increasing by a factor of 25%, or decreasing, as the case may be. And finally, in the lower right-hand corner, we have the auto-save options. And finally, in the lower right-hand corner, we have the auto-save options. Please remember auto-save. These are so critical that it's a little painful. Because unreal, <laughs> Please uh, remember auto-save. Make like sure that it's always on, because Unreal, uh, or UDK, like any it. application, does under crash UDK occasionally, and you don't want to lose your work. Uh, under maps, you should find under your UDK install folder, all of your uh, under maps, you should find an auto saves uh, folder, and all of your auto saves get placed in, in there. Uh, that keep that in mind. Work. It will save you in case you do get a crash, so that you don't lose much work. You can so you also change the increment of these saves. So at this point, every so you have your auto save interval currently set to ten minutes. So at this point, every ten minutes, my save is going to go off and back my level up. I will throw this out there if you start building. Building really big, really complex levels, you may have to change your interval a little bit because sometimes it's so tight that it gets to be kind of problematic. The video lags a lot. There's not much. Somebody says my audio works fine, but the video lags a lot. There's not much we can do about that. Yeah, there's going to be people around the world that are going to be viewing and seeing the audio video absolutely fine. Uh, it really comes down to where you're located from um, the nearest uh, Citrix so server and all that. Just, good stuff. Yeah, definitely yeah. keep that. Keep in mind that we're recording this, and if it's just yeah, definitely keep along, it, keep in mind that we are recording this, and if it's just too laggy for you to follow later, along, um, uh, please consider just grabbing the video later, um, just you know, in case it's just unwatchable. Yeah, absolutely, that's, that's pretty much your your tour around view. We're on the interface. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. A quick introduction to it, and it's perfect so timing, really, because we're right at one hour of recorded content. So what I want to do is go ahead and put everyone on break. So if you need to go grab some coffee or just stand up, use bathroom, whatever. Now's perfect time for doing that. We'll take a ten minute. Break, which is what we usually do at the hour marks in the we'll class. And Zach, this time around, let's go ahead and hit stop on this, and we'll so break this up back, into a part one and a part two type of thing. So when we get back, we're going to be we'll moving on then. into building some stuff. Right, yep, so and we'll see you guys then. Go ahead, go ahead and throw right, a naming. You know the type so naming yeah, yeah. Go ahead and go ahead and throw a naming. You know the type naming convention. Yeah, yeah.